we are going to have Lauren, who is one of the, the uh, who I've known now for a long time and has done a lot of different things in a lot of different fields. I will let her introduce herself, but uh, she's going to talk about saddle fitting, but she does it from a very scientific standpoint. So I will hand it over to you. All right. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mick. Um, and um, thank you all for your interest, actually, in this topic. It's quite um, some some different topic compared to the others we had so far. And um, I actually also want to um, um, say that I really appreciate um, the the meetings here. We have every uh, second week. A, I, I have learned quite a lot so far, and I really hope I can give you something back. Um, <laughs> by uh, talking about saddle fit tonight and um, the role of the biomechanics in horse health. And um, yeah, as uh, Mick already mentioned, um, I, I, I would, might um, um, introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Maren Boliver, for everyone who does not know me. I'm a bio, uh, neurobiologist. Um, and after my PhD, which is about... Mm, 13 years ago now, um, I joined the industry by um, becoming a, um, a scientific consultant in the healthcare industry. And that was actually about the time I met uh, Mick and Robert in Maine, at UMaine, when I was, was visiting Orono. And um, actually, this was quite a turning point for me because um, it gave me the chance to... Um, to um, turn my 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 actually passion the horses into my profession um we did a lot of um um projects together also in collaboration with um some institutions like the fbi and um also in collaboration with um, other companies um who i worked with later on as well as a um, scientific consultant and um about eight years ago, then I um, founded my own um, company, More Pferde Therapy. Um, after several years of training, I um, became a um, equine physiotherapist and osteopath, and also a saddle fitter. And nowadays, I um, serve around five to six hundred clients a year, um, mainly in Austria right now, where I'm living. Um, so right now I'm living in Innsbruck. This is a little city in, in Austria. It's in the middle of the Alps, um, surrounded by mountains, very beautiful. Um, but originally I'm from Germany and um, this is actually where we um, move to very, very soon in um, summertime. We move back to, to Germany after eight years of um, Austria and um, we go up quite far north um, to Bremen. This is a city, um, it is surrounded by a region in Germany where a lot of horses um, are located, a lot of very good riders as well. So I'm very excited about this new uh, perspective also in a professional way. So tonight um, I will mainly talk about cells. <laughs> I will start uh, with a little introduction about the bag, the healthy bag and um, the reason why a horse actually can carry us. Um, I will continue with some theoretics and th um, some theory um, about the location of a well-fitting saddle and close with um, some practical aspects of my daily life as a saddle fitter. Um, yeah, so let's start with the question, how and why can a horse actually carry us? Um, horses are obviously not born with a rider on top of it, so they are not actually made for um, carrying a rider, but it's still possible and also possible in a sound way for the horse. And um, to understand this, um, I will show you a little example or a comparison. Um, so if we have a look to the back of the horse, it um, is actually behaving similar like a bookshelf, which is supported by um, the limbs at each end. And um, if um, the, uh, or the stronger the shelf or the back of the horse is, the healthier the back is. And of course, then the better the ability to carry a rider. So if we compare the kind of a healthy back here um, compared um, with a horse with a more sway-backed um, back here, this is kind of quite, a, quite an old horse. 
um, you can uh, already see that there's a difference um, in the strength of the back um, and by that also the sound, soundness of the horse. Um, looking a little bit closer to the back here, um, you can see the skeleton of the horse, the spine, um, with the spinous processes, especially in the thoracic um, area, um, the spinous processes are very long, especially in the wither region. And um, we come back to the um, two different type of horsebacks, the more sound horseback here, straight line there, and the more swaybacked horse here. You can imagine how the spinous processes look like. So the more hollow the back, the more likely um, this process spine, um, spine spinous processes um, come together, and the more likely back pain for the for the horse um, will be generated. And this is because um, the closer the um, process uh, spinous processes um, come, the more likely um, um, a certain disease will appear, which is called kissing spines. You may have heard of that. Um, it's a disease where the um, spinous processes come very close together together until they touch each other uh, and fuse, fuse together um, in a very painful and um, inflammational process. Um, well, it's kissing spines because they, you know, kind of um, touch each other. Um, and this is usually, um, yeah, end of the career of a riding horse. Um, of course, we want to prevent that. Um, coming back to the, to the horse back and the um, um, yeah, the, the soundness of the horseback. Um, when we imagine that um, a rider will sit on the back, it's not only um, the rider itself and the, um, the the weight of the rider which will impact the the back of the horse, but also the complete um, um, thorax of the horse itself, because. Um, this region here, the thorax, uh, thor thoracic um, part um, region of the horse, um, the weight only the weight of this region is more or less half of the complete body weight of the horse. So if you imagine you have a um, normal warm blood with 1,100 laps, um, it's about 600 um, to 660 laps of um, yeah of weight pulling down towards the 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 ground due to gravity and if we put on a, a rider um, as well um, there's quite a lot of, of, of weight to um, to carry and actually there is quite a um, clever way um, nature has invented for this problem um, for this um, there's a kind of a passive um, stabilization mechanism the horse has um, namely with a supraspinous ligament um, this is a two-part ligament, ligament above the spinous processes, and um, it starts between the ears here at the occiput at the head of the horse, goes all the way down the neck, down the withers, um, over the back, um, nearly until the end um, to the sacrum of the horse, and it, is, it connects the entire horse from head to tail. Um, the connection in the cervical um, or with a cervical vertebra is realized by the nuchal lamina here. So it uh, really actually has a connection to the complete spine. And um, in a biomechanical sense, um, it has a very um, important impact. Um, so imagine if the, the horse puts its head down, which is actually the natural um, um, posture a horse has, like in, in nature, 12, 14, um, hours a day a horse grazes with the heads down uh, which will flex the back and by that um, putting the head down the supraspinous ligament will be tense and by that it will pen out the spinous processes so the equine back will be kept against the gravity and this is a um, long-term posture so um, very relaxing and, and sound and healthy for the horse. The opposite, if the heads get up um, for the horse so um, the, the back will be extended. Um, in this case the spinous processes will um, move closer together and um, generating a very stable and well, stiff or stable back and the horse is ready to flee. This is also a nature condition in the horse, but only for a short term, um, short, short term, short term posture. So, um, 
the natural and sound um, condition would be more um, this situation here, but also um, the horse will be capable to um, to to flee and to stabilize um, the back very quickly. During training um, and um, promoting um, a sound bag and a sound self carriage, um, we want to um, have the first um, situation in the horse where the neck is stretched and the back is relaxed, and we have a activated and um, um, yeah an activated um, ventral line of the horse, and um, we try to avoid in training the situation here. Where the, where the back is more extended and the spinous processes come closer together. Um, we also try to do this um, from the saddle. It's not always that easy. You really need to be a skilled rider to, to um, perform movements like this. But after a while, um, yeah, um, this would be the way uh, a horse um, um, will generate a sound back. Of course, not only the training, but also the, the weight you put on the horse is very important for for sound back. And um, there's a lot of discussion about that. Recently, there was a review about um, um, the advice and or the uh, summary of um, different publications. And the advice um, they came up with was, was that about 50% um, of the horse's body weight um, the the rider shouldn't exceed. So meaning if you have again a, just a normal warm blood with thousand thousand one hundred laps, um, the rider shouldn't be heavier than one hundred sixty five laps. So sometimes it's not very realistic, I'd say, but um, this would be the advice and the suggestion to, um, they they came up. Um, and of course, mounting the horse is also a very important factor and um, parameter um, to um, support the back. So here I demonstrated it with my own horse and um, show will show you um, how the different mounting methods um, will um, Im uh, will have impact on the saddle and the uh, and the motion of the horse's back. So first um, you can see how I mount the horse from the ground. And if you have a look to the saddle, um, it will slip dramatically from one side or to one side towards me. And of course I have to readjust it. Um, if I mount from a, yeah, from a mounting block or a stand, um, the situation is a little bit better, but you still can see I need to readjust the saddle a little bit. Um, the best way, of course, would be not to touch the stirrups and mount um, from a higher stand, like a fence or something. Um, also here, they, there, there are some publications um, about the best way to mount a horse. Obviously, um, uh, from the ground isn't the best way because um, the peak pressure is uh, highly increased uh, in the total force, especially at the contralateral side of the withers. So the withers are the stabilizing um, structure during the mountain, mounting process. And you can imagine, as I said before, the withers, um, this is the region where the spinous processes are the longest. Um, and also the rotational um, aspect is probably um, of importance here. Um, yeah, and finally, of course, uh, of course, a good saddle fit um, will be essential to keep the horse back sound. And um, therefore, I would like um, to yeah to to show you a little bit more um, insight in that. So, um, why using a saddle at all? Um, of course, the most important purpose of a saddle is the distribution of the rider's weight. Um, and here there was a publication about a comparison of um, a rider sitting on the horse with a treat saddle, so with a, a saddle with a um, rigid tree in it, and um, the rider sitting on the horse without a saddle. What you can see here is a pressure map, um, meaning that um, um, the, the, the colder colors will um, um, show regions of lower pressure and the warmer colors um, indicate um, higher pressures. And as you can see here in this example, um, the weight of the rider is um, largely distribute, distributed, even if there is some peak pressure here. Um, but if you compare it with a situation without any saddle, you can see the high or the peak pressure um, is much um, 
more located and um, focally um, located underneath the seat bones of the, the rider. And of course, this would uh, lead to some discomfort in the horse if you if you ride a horse like this after, over time. Um, and of course, also depends on the weight of the rider. <clears throat> so here I will show you some drastic um, example of my, my own daily work. So um, just to um, emphasize um, the need that the saddle not only needs to fit the horse, ideally, but also um, that the saddle really needs to, to fit the rider as well. So if you see the girl here, this is a, um, a young woman. She gained a lot of weight during a disease, but she still wanted to ride her pony. So this situation was when I when I came to her first and she used her old saddle um, where she obviously was yeah, too, too big for, for the saddle now. As you can see, the most of the weight is um, uh, located at the end of the saddle. So there's a lot of pressure more in the back end of the saddle, um, quarterly um, in the back of the horse. Um, so we decided to improve this, this situation by using another saddle. Um, and here you can see the saddle is fitting the rider much better. She fits into the seat um, um, way better than before. Uh, which also improved the situation for the horse dramatically because now the rider's weight is distributed um, to the horse back equally. And this is actually the whole point about using the saddle. Um, if one ignores the, um, the well fitting of a saddle, um, of course, this in the end will, will cause pain for the horse, but there are also some more subtle, um, yeah. Uh, indication that a saddle is not fitting to a horse and this can start for example um, from impact locomotion um, tripping of course tension in the back if the saddle is not fitting and um, changes in behavior um, more drastic um, um, symptoms of course would be kissing spines pain discomfort um, or um, yeah misbehavior like bucking and um, biting and so on. So um, now I would like to, to talk a little bit more about the location of well-fitting saddle because this, this is something um, which um, can be, um, or which is actually true for every horse because it will orientate um, on the anatomy of the horse. Um, of course, um, all horses have the same or more or less the same anatomy. Um, with individual changes or, um, yeah, but um, those points I will um, um, show you in a mid minute um, are actually, um, yeah, um, you can you can actually perform on every horse because the an anatomy is, um, is more or less the same in every horse. So I start um, with the first point. Um, the shoulder blade and the saddle um, needs to be placed behind the shoulder blade. So here you can see the scapula, the shoulder blade, um, which consists of two parts, the bony part here in um, pink and um, uh, with a um, cartilage um, on the top of the shoulder blade here in gray. Um, the bony part is something you can palpate um, during or um, um, on a horse directly. The cartilage um, is a little bit, yeah, uh, difficult to to palpate and to feel, um, but um, it's enough if one yeah palpate the, the bony part, and the saddle um, in, as, um, needs to or necessarily needs to be placed behind the bony part, the shoulder blade. Um, if you have the saddle here placed behind it, um, it. But most of the treat saddle consists of a um, of an iron gallet, which is um, needed to be or usually um, be um, about two three fingers behind the beginning of the saddle. So um, it is important that this gallet will be um, at this location to um, leave enough room for the shoulder to freely move. Because as you know, as the um, Forelimb will um, go forward in the protraction, the scapula rotates backwards and the other way around. 
and this is about like two or three um, centimeters um, in in length. So um, therefore, it is very important that the saddle lies behind it. The right angle of the gullet is also very important. Otherwise, um, there will be also impairment of the shoulder movement. Um, if the saddle is located too far in front, um, of course, the shoulder will be um, not moving properly. And you can also see that the balance of the saddle will be tipped um, backwards, which also um, is very um, yeah, uncomfortable for the horse and um, can result in, in a discomfort and even pain. <clears throat> Another or the second um, important point to um, place and locate the saddle is um, um, not until the last thoracic vertebra, T18. So the saddle shouldn't be longer than this um, region or um, area here. Um, T18, this is the, the area where the last um, um, rib is attached between, so between T18 and T17 to be um, exact. And um, the saddle shouldn't be longer than this. So um, the lumbar section, which um, is continued or, or is following the thoracic um, section here, is not stable enough to, to carry a saddle and a rider. Um, the reason why the thoracic uh, vertebra or um, spine is more stable is um, because there are the ribs attached to, so they give, give more um, mechanical stability. And the more um, you, you the more you come um, um, cranial, um, the more stable the horse is because the first part of the ribs, the, the first of the eight, uh, first eight ribs are even attached to the sternum. So this region here is even more stable. So um, we also have a transition um, of muscle at this region here. This is a lumbar section. Um, where a horse can be very sensitive. So um, in this region here, um, the saddle should be located um, because the transition of the longissimus and the iliocostalis muscle um, into the gluteus muscle um, is often a region a horse can be very sensitive, especially if the, if the saddle is too long or if the balance isn't right and the, uh, it tips backwards in this direction. Um, it's also very important to avoid any pressure on any nerves. So um, we do have a nerve line here. Um, uh, it is actually the, the part where sometimes the horizontal panels of the saddle lays as well. Um, this is the region where also the ribs come out of the body. So, um, and um, where, where they are starting to be, to be um, palpatable. Um, so this is a very sensitive region in the horseback. Um, it's not very often in um, in reality that the panel really lays here, but sometimes, for example, in Western saddles, which have longer panels or longer bars here, um, they can um, yeah give some pressure on the nerve ending. Of course, this this might be painful for the horse. Um, also important part, the part behind the shoulder blade, the so-called trapezius um, area, trapezius muscle is uh, laying here. This is a tra trapezius muscle. And um, you often see horses with those hollows behind the shoulder blade. And um, this is sometimes, not not always, even if, the, um, if it's always blamed for it, but um, sometimes um, the reason for it is an un, well, not well-fitting saddle. Um, there can be also others, other courses for this. But if the saddle puts on too much um, focal pressure in this region here, um, this results um, to, to muscle atrophy due to um, ischemia. So um, if the blood flow isn't um, um, yeah, normal anymore because the pressure is too high, the muscle um, can... Uh, decrease or the volume of the muscle can decrease and there's also a very important um, re reflex point um, at this um, area here and if there's too much pressure on this reflex point um, it can um, result in a um, uh, in a sinking trunk so the horse is able to move the trunk um, downwards and upwards due to um, a flexible um, uh, yeah, trunk support system 
it is called a thoracic sling. You may have heard of this. Um, and this is due to um, the fact that a horse has no clavicular bone. So it's a very flexible um, um, area here the horse has. Um, and the function or the biomechanic function behind this um, is, uh, is a shock absorber. So the horse is um, able to yeah, move the trunk um, very easily upwards and, and downwards, um, especially if um, there's motion in the horse, if it's um, trotting, galloping, or even jumping. And after the jump, um, this shock absorbing system will um, um, buffer most of the force um, what uh, hits, um, hits the horse. Um, but if there's um, a ill-fitting saddle, putting pressure here on top of um, or behind the shoulder blade, um, the trunk will be moved downwards. And um, after a while, the muscle will uh, change accordingly. Uh, they will elongate in a very yeah um, unsound way. And um, the shock absorbing system will be impaired as well. The clearance of the supraspinous ligament and the withers is also very important. Um, you already have heard of the supraspinous ligament before, so it's in the midline of the or median line of the horse here. And um, above the withers, we have this supraspinous borsa, which is also very sensitive on horses. And as you can see, there is not much, yeah space until the, the saddle um, will be placed here. So um, we we have this ligament, the borsa, and then already there, there's the spine coming up um, at the region where the wither is. So even more important is that this area at the withers, but also at the median line of the horse will be um, free of any pressure. And um, for this, of course, the panels need to be um, placed correctly. Um, this gullet channel would be way too narrow, especially in the end, and puts pressure on the supraspinous ligament. Better, of course, would be a more clearance here, um, at least three to four fingers, like five centimeters. Um, finally, the balance of the saddle um, and um, of the horse is, is very important because as the rider sits on the on the horse, if it's sitting on the and in in balance means um, that it needs to sit in balance with the horse and um, the nature of balance or the center of gravity of the horse is approximately approximately behind the withers, so um, at between well more or less um, between the tenth and thirteenth uh, thoracic vertebra, and um, if we sit on a horse without any saddle, the horse will will automatically um, shift us or sit us um, in this region um, so that we sit with our center of mass um, uh, above the center of mass of the horse. So this would be the position where we can be in most balance and the horse can be balanced um, as well. But if we put on a saddle um, to the horse, you can see that the deepest point of the saddle, so the balance point of the saddle, um, in most cases, it is a little bit shifted compared to the balance of the horse. So if I go back, this would be the balance of the horse and um, this situation where the saddle is a little bit different. Plus, you can see that the, the rider, which uh, before would fit very nicely on the horse, would have trouble with this uh, dressage saddle um, space-wise. So um, sometimes it's really not easy to um, match all the points. Um, but in the end, if um, the saddle fits the the rider good, so that he or she can sit in the saddle um, in a balanced way, also the horse can be in balance. And um, this is very important to yeah, to, to ride a horse to support the sound back of the horse. Um, now I would like to to come from the theory more into the practical um, part. Um, during my saddle fitting procedures, I um, look mainly to um, to different points, um, but the main points um, I would like to, to share with you here. Um, first point would be the tree length, the gullet width, um, and the balance points uh, point we already talked about. Um, the tree curve is very important to um, evaluate as well as um, the panels. The girth, pads, and all the attachments are also very important to evaluate um, 
but yeah, this would be a little bit too far today. Um, so I um, give you some examples um, from the uh, first five points here. And um, yeah, this was, was a situation from a new client. So the cell uh, was way too long, um, exceeding the um, T18 region resulting, or it, this can result in a very painful situation for the horse and of course unwillingness um, like bucking or um, similar. Um, yeah, if you see a set like this, um, there's no way to adjust anything. Um, yeah, you cannot shorten a set, so this is a no-go. Um, the next point would be the gullet and um, this as I said in the beginning, the angle of the gullet always need to match the angle of the um, of the shoulder, and this would be a view from um, from the front. If it is too narrow and pinches into the um, region where the behind the shoulder blade, um, of course, this would be very um, painful for the horse and um, can result in the um, already um, talked problems. Um, but it also shifts the the balance of the saddle dramatically into the back and um, um, yeah, resulting not only in pain, but also maybe in muscle atrophy for the horse. The other way around, if the gullet is too wide, um, this will also shift the balance of the saddle and thereby also by the um, rider into the, the front part. Um, the rider is not really able to, to sit um, yeah, on the seat bones anymore. And in the worst case, um, the saddle is so wide that it also hits or touches the wither region here. And this can, yeah, have, this can have dramatic consequences. So you never want to touch the withers um, by the gullet here. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can really have um, some bad injuries. Um, if it's very acute, of course, um, yeah, those um, those bad injuries um, like you see here. After a while, um, or if, if the the tissue is not damaged uh, yet, um, you can also detect um, some white hairs in some cases. Unfortunately, this is a situation where what you can only see um, when the coat of the horse is changed. So during um, spring or autumn. Um, and it not really reflects the actual situation. So it can be that the saddle was uh, ill-fitting half a year ago and you only can, or you detect the white hairs uh, just a couple of months later. Um, so again, we, we want to avoid this. So therefore it's very important to have clearance on the dorsal part of the withers, but also on the um, lateral part. And um, this can be managed by the shape of the gullet. There are different shapes on the market like this V-shaped gullet here. And as you can see, it um, puts on a lot of pressure um, laterally on the wither. So there we need also some clearance, which will be realized with a more U-shaped um, um, gullet in this um, example. My job is then if um, a gullet is not fitting angle-wise, um, to make it fit <laughs> and um, there are some yeah uh, devices on the market to um, um, change the metal plate the gullet um, mechanically um, not all trees um, are adjustable but um, yeah um, at the moment or um, yeah, there are more and more models on the market which are adjustable now. So um, earlier or in the in the past, um, it wasn't that easy to to adjust the saddles in this way, but it's coming more and more. Um, it's possible to do this um, directly at the client. So um, with this cold press, or there are some models on the market um, you need to um, adjust with heat, so thermally, um, and this needs several hours to do that. So um, this is more in the um, yeah, and you cannot do this um, directly at the client. The balance point of the saddle also very important. Um, at its best, it matches the the balance point or the center of mass of the of the um, horse um, to promote the best balance. But this, of course, depends on the saddle model. And um, here we would like to show you an example of an Icelandic horse and 
an Icelandic saddle. Um, traditionally, a lot of Icelandic saddles have their balance points um, way back um, in at the end of the saddle, like here. And what you can see with the with the rider and the horse um, is they are both quite out of balance. So um, it was not really possible for the rider to to keep the balance, and the horse was just running to keep somehow the balance with the rider. Um, same horse, same rider with another another saddle, um, and the balance point is more centered, and um, the situation was changed um, immediately. Another um, parameter to um, take an, an eye on is the shape of the horse's back. It needs to match the um, shape of the tree. So if you have a more straight back and put on a cr very curved saddle, of course, you have a lot of rocking in the saddle. So it's like a yeah, banana shaped saddle on a, on a flat um, surface and um, the rocking points can cause um, damage or pain or damage to the horse's back as well. And the other way around, if you have a curved um, back, uh, horse back, and put on a very straight saddle, um, most pressure will be um, at four points in the front and in the back, and there's bridging or lower pressure, which is also not um, a, a good situation. So you uh, really want to have an equally distributed weight um, of the rider um, realized by the saddle. And these are some yeah, just... Um, examples of a two curved saddle on a straight back of a horse and you can already see the the rider has really trouble to to keep the balance same rider same horse different saddle here on the right side of the picture um and the weight is much better distributed and the opposite of example um there's a curved um, back and a very straight saddle and yeah, you can actually see it in the face of the horse as well that um, it always uh, already yeah results in in a lot of pain there. Um, another important factor is the panel. Um, it's very important to have a yeah um, um, equally um, or, or a panel which um, lays on the back equally. And for that, of course, I I need to evaluate the panels before I put it on the horse and. There can be differences between the angles of the panels, which you can see here in the middle picture, but also um, in the in the in the filling of the panels. Most or yeah, there are different filling um, um, materials. Um, the wool panels is something I I work um, yeah I like to work with because you can adjust this. There are also form panels on the market which you cannot adjust. But uh, with wool, um, you are able to, um, yeah, to correct and to, um, yeah, to adjust the, the form and the, the, um, the softness of the saddle. But as you can see here in the little video, um, the softness on the on the right side of the saddle, or actually it's the left side, but the other way around, um, um, is much softer compared to the left side. And of course, this. Asymmetry and flocking of a saddle has dramatic impact on the horse in motion. So if you have a look here to the horse, I um, have a video before and after the adjustment of the saddle. So have a closer look to the midline of the saddle and you see that the saddle is slipping. This is afterwards, so sorry, this is in German. Um, this is after the adjustment and this situation before the adjustment. Um, so you can see again after <clears throat> and before the adjustment, and you can see how much the saddle is slipping to the left side here. Um, I did a screenshot to yeah, to have a better visualization to that, and um, also here you can um, easily see how the saddle slips to, to the left side. Even the um, length of the stirrup seems to be a little bit longer on the left side due to the slippage, um, and yeah, and the whole rider is crooked in the in the complete um, posture. Um, I have screenshotted the same swing face of the horse, so um, that's not a manipulation by the you know by the movement of the horse. Um, so it's yeah kind of comparable here. Um, the reasons for slipping and slippage and asymmetry um, of the saddle can be diff uh, diverse. Um, 
there, there are actually yeah three parameters um, which can um, influence um, a slippage. This first would be, of course, um, the rider, the horse, and the saddle itself. Um, the horse can be asymmetric in the shape um, of the back. Um, it can be also, um, yeah, the rider because he's sitting um, crookedly, as actually this person does. Um, if the saddle is adjusted, you can still see there is a crookedness in the um, in the posture of the rider. So some physiotherapy would be probably good for the rider as well. Um, of course, if the saddle is not um, symmetric from the beginning, it can um, cause slippage as well. And um, um, there are several st studies about um, the correlation be between hind limb lameness and saddle slip as well. So there's something very um, um, interesting, um, as I think, um, because you can see even subtile hind limb lameness by the slippage of the cell. So um, if um, the saddle slips to the left side, it might be a hind limb blameless in the left hind limb as well. Um, so I wouldn't use it as a diagnostic tool, but um, it can give some ideas um, of the cause of the um, yeah, slippage of the, of the cell. And um, therefore I'm always, um, try to analyze the source of the asymmetry. If I see a slippage or any asymmetry of the saddle, I'm, um, I like to use those um, west where you can visualize um, the straight or asymmetry or symmetry uh, of horse, saddle and rider. And of course, um, flocking and adjusting the saddle. Um, I try to do this um, directly at the client so I can um, show the results um, before and after the adjustment and the rider can feel it directly. Most of the saddles have those little slots, those little um, um, hollows in the panels where I can fill the wool in. Um, again, there are several types of wool um, to be um, to be used. Um, I always use the same wool which is already in the saddle to to avoid any lumps. So, yeah, and um, for me, it's very important to um, also educate um, the, the clients, increase the awareness to have um, sustainable results in the saddle fitting in the end. So um, I always start with new clients, I always start to explain anatomy and the saddle fitting. Um, and um, I always measure the horse shape um, using some devices for that um, at every appointment to see and compare anatomical changes over time. And um, yeah, of course, I'm also doing this in motion, not only in um, in the static um, or standing horse um, and record and eval evaluate the horse rider cell interaction um, all together. Sometimes I also use some um, digital ads like this pressure mat. Um, I like to use it um, more like an additional tool um, to back up my findings I did before and not as a solo tool. So um, to evaluate the saddle fit only by um, a pressure map or pressure video, um, this is something, in my opinion, is not really, um, yeah, um, this is not really possible. You need to take into account so many different um, and diverse uh, param parameters, um, but it can give you some ideas about the causes of a not or ill-fitting saddle or impaired movement of the of the horse underneath the cell. Yeah, and sometimes um, saddle fitting is not really an option. Um, as you can see here, this is actually the old horse from the beginning. And uh, when I came there first, it had this very old saddle as well. Um, and as you can see, saddle way too long. The balance point was a nightmare. So um, it was just way too much in, in the back and um, um, tip backwards. Um, the gallet width was insanely narrow. Um, the horse had already um, some yeah um, bony um, problems. Um, so, but the rider still wanted to ride the horse, and the horse was really really happy to 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 get ridden. Actually, um, kind of surprising. Um, so we decided to. Um, to get a new saddle for this horse. And as you can see, it was possible to find a shorter saddle with a better better balance 
and um, now the horse just turned 30 years and is still uh, ridden and uh, yeah the owner does some um trail rides with a horse and is yeah very happy with, with this old halflinger <laughs> and with this um yeah positive perspective i'd say i would like to thank you about the the interest and um i'm happy to to answer questions if you have some Thank you, Ruben. That was fun. Are there <laughs> questions? I have several. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just uh, questions that I've always had questions about. Um, Excellent. So one thing that I've always wondered is with horses that naturally are more U-shaped, mm -hmm. like, and especially they are trained that way. So like saddlebreds or gated horses mm -hmm. how does that affect their soundness their back soundness yeah um well <laughs> to answer this i mean um in my opinion the same in um in in horse breeds it's the same in in dog breeds there are some breeds um how to put this um that are not the best for soundness i'd say so the anatomic uh, anatomy would be the same um nevertheless if you have a you know warm blood uh, um um a hackney or a saddlebred um horse um especially if it's um, trained in a way where the extension um, is the goal of the extension of the, of the, um, of the bag. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have any um, practical exper experiences with the long-term soundness of the bag in these horses, but I, um, um, yeah, my guess is that um, if the horses are, are trained and used um, as the breed is four, they probably won't get too old. Okay. Mm. Um, another yeah. thing is, so something that I've seen a lot of people do if they cannot have a saddle fitter come to the barn, um, if they're trying a saddle for the first time, a common thing to do is just use a singular saddle pad underneath of the saddle and ride the horse until they sweat and then take the saddle pad off and look at the sweat marks to see if it's mm -hmm. evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a correct thing to do or? Yeah, I know that there are a lot of people doing it and advising it as well. Um, yeah. In my opinion, it doesn't really um, reflect the actual situation underneath the saddle because um, Sweating, it's not only with a with a pad or a light, um, I don't know, towel or something, but um, some people also um, try or use um, the, the sweat marks or the dust marks of the horse um, to evaluate the saddle fit. And problem is that the horse, the the, the sweat um, glands of um, of the um, of the of the uh, skin of the horse um, are not dis distributed equally mm. in the complete saddle region so there are spots which can um, sweat more or um, earlier than other spots um, so it's not really an yeah an objective um, tool to to evaluate it in my opinion of course if you have a um, if you train your horse and you always see some dry spot underneath the stirrup bars for example you might consider yeah get an expert and um yeah try to to find the the cause behind it but um yeah it might can uh, it, it can probably give you some ideas but um it shouldn't be over evaluated yeah yeah i've seen some people that that's the only way that they test it and then other people that's kind of the starting point and then they'll go mm -hmm. on and test other things as well but. yeah yeah, it's probably not not bad, not a not a bad idea to to start with it, especially if you have no other devices. If you're yeah. on 
was our owner and yeah just want want to have something but um yeah you definitely need to to have more evaluation than that yeah mm -hmm. yeah it, it it sorry it actually also depends on the i mean on the you know um on the saddlebed pet you have underneath and the yeah. blocking material for example as well yeah so mm -hmm. there's many um parameters to take into account and um, to think of why and where a horse is wedding yeah and sorry, <laughs> I, can, mm -hmm. I can talk talk about this for ages. Um, um, plus, there, for example, the dust marks. Um, some people use as well. Um, of course, it depends on the dust you have on the horse. But um, a lot of people think that more dust or more marks on a you know on a white um, towel you put underneath the saddle more marks uh, means more pressure which is actually not true because if you have more uh, even more sweat can be not more pressure but more movement for example so especially in the back end of the of the saddle you sometimes if you have a rocking saddle you have more movement and um and in in most of the cases you have more more sweating here as well so it doesn't really mean you know um there's no answer for or no kit category for more sweat more pressure or you know and therefore it's sometimes a little bit difficult to um um to to analyze the sweat pattern dust pattern yeah mm -hmm. um i have one more question yeah. um so for people who ride a lot of different horses using the same saddle i've yeah. heard that it's better to have a wider tree than a more narrow tree and then you can fit it to the horse using a half pad underneath depending on the horse if you you know you can use a half pad or risers depending mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. what yeah um yeah i know this is like um daily practice <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, in, in the perfect world, the the gullet width and the you know it should match the horse's mm -hmm. uh, um, shoulder angle. But if it's not possible because A B C, then um, uh, it's probably it's probably better to have a little wider um, tree width um, compared to a more narrow tree width. That's for sure. But um, it also depends on what um, pet you put underneath. So, for example, if you have a um, end plus what um, type of back the horse has. So, if you have a normal muscled um, back of the horse, a sound horse back, um, if you put a, um, a more a wider saddle on, on top of it and um, compensate it by, for example, a sheepskin, it might work. Um, but this depends actually again on, on the type of sheepskin because there are also differences. Um, I actually use and like the sheepskin more in horses where who, who, which have a muscle atrophy to compensate the um, loss of muscles by the sheepskin. But then you need to have a very good quality of sheepskin, which lift the saddle a little bit um, um, above the missing muscles kind of so um, um, a little bit dorsal and um, by that you increase the room or the space between the saddle um, and the horse body but if you use a um, yeah a sheepskin with less quality um, and you sit on the saddle and the sheepskin everything you know lifts downwards and you have um, a saddle situation with less space between saddle and um, body um, which results in more pressure so as you see it, it always depends on the horse shape what you put, put underneath you it depends on the material what you put underneath and um, um, and it depends on um, on the use of the, the horse and the saddle um, I wouldn't suggest using one saddle to different horses because the panels will um, change the form due to the form of the or in correspondence to the form of the back yeah. um of course if you have a sheepskin or memory form or whatever pet underneath um, an absorption a shock absorption pet underneath um you will 
um, decrease the time of the panel changing a little bit because the um, you know the cushioning um, of the panel will um, um, well the panel wouldn't um, change that much uh, because of the cushioning of the of the pad you put underneath but still um, of course the best way would would be to to use one saddle for one horse and this should fit ideally perfectly yeah i think that's the ideal situation for yeah. every equestrian but <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know, I know. I'm, yeah, yeah i'm sorry I, i'm um if if, if, I, if I would course. advise in a kind of a emergent situation because it's a trainer or whatever only having one saddle and 12 horses and no money yeah. um yeah, then I would say, okay, it's not too bad, but then please use the high quality sheepskin um, yeah. um, pad. The riser are also very common, especially the rubber rubber um, material risers. Problem is, if you rise a saddle in the back, mostly it's in the back, or most of the time it's in the back, um, then um, you uh, ignore the fact that. Um, what the cause is, um, why you need to, to to rise it in the back. Most of the time, it's um, a gullet which is too narrow, and if you rise the back, you even put more pressure in the in the front. If you rise the, if you need to rise the front of the cell because the the gullet is too wide, as in your example, um, it's probably the better better way compared to to this situation uh, rising the back. Because um, yeah, then you can compensate a little bit um, the um, the situation that the gallant is too wide. Yeah. So okay. you can, in my opinion, you can you can do this. It's but probably it's not the best practice. <laughs> but it well, wouldn't hurt. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt the, the the horse too much if you do it in the front compared to the back. Mm -hmm. So I always end up with a technological solution to every problem, right? The Excellent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <I need has, laughs> has anybody done anything with the 3D imaging, especially like the LiDAR that's on iPhones to do imaging of the back? And again, this is sort of the first cut. I can imagine that you get close. Then after that, it's the experts making the final adjustments. But has anybody done yeah. something with that? Absolutely, yes. Um, I tried to uh, share the screen again. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's a um, device on the market. It's called Horse Shape. Maybe ha you have heard of that. Um, can you see that? My yep. Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah, we can see yep. it. And um, what they did, well, they actually have this scan thing. Let's see if I can see or show you somewhere um they um actually about the technology behind that i'm i'm not really aware of but um in the past they used this um laser um device to um to image the horse back in a three-dimensional way and now very recently they developed this um i think it's lidar driven app um using the smartphone uh, which is actually for free. So I tried this. Um, so what, what you need to do is actually just scan the horse back and you, um, um, generate a three dimensional, um, yeah, horse shape back. Um, I tried to get in touch with them, but, um, because I, I was really interested in this kind of handy to use, um, devices. Um, what I am especially interested in is, um, the comparison between both sides to, can you see actually, can you see what I'm showing you here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> so what I'm, um, mostly interested in is, interested in is, um, the comparison of, um, the two sides, like the left shoulder compared to the, uh, like the, um, dimension of the left shoulder compared to the dimension of the right shoulder. Um, and also changes over time. So maybe some overlaying of the images. This would be something in my practice, which would be very useful. So I can, um, save time in measuring manually. That would be perfect. Um, I couldn't reach them 
personally yet, but um, I'm on it. If you have any um, quick turns to that, I would be very happy <laughs> if we can <laughs> sort something out. Yeah, it seems like that might be a really interesting thing just to look at over time, the changes as well as yeah. the asymmetry. And then yeah. basically, if you could get started, then you could adjust the, it yeah. can even get you started on the adjustment, something like that. Yeah. 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 What they also do, um, they had this before with this uh, more old school system. I, I just showed you with a, with a laser um, they put above the, the back. Um, they gain a lot of data points with that. And um, let's see if I can show you. With those data points, another manufacturer, um, Tomax. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, oh no, Land Rover, no. Um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> no, it's here. Um, they have this, you know, construction uh, like this artificial yeah. horse back. <laughs> yeah, so, that's the next yeah. step. Is you yeah, that's really right. Cool. Right. So now um to you know um translate or transfer the the horses back into the uh into into the house and um i might can show you oh yeah this is a quite a nice demonstration i think um, uh, let's see if i can show you yeah so they have this data points sorry the music is annoying um, they have this data points either manually um, generated by a certain system they invented or um, technically by this, um, you know, um, uh, laser device. And then they can use those data points to um, generate the artificial horseback. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is only a situation of the standing horse and doesn't really um, reflect the real-time situation and motion of course but it it is a first um idea and impression to you know to adjust the saddle um in the yeah in-house not at the stable that's very cool all right i've got a completely i'll go 90 degrees from that too then uh you know i always think about racing and in racing yep. the riders are asymmetric they ride ac doocy Oh yeah, it, they're um, uh, especially especially in North America because they're turning left, yeah. and and so what what's what's the thinking on what that would do to the uh, back? I mean, it's very interesting thinking how uh, the loading and and of course there's on a dirt track it slopes to the inside rail. Yeah. But then the rider is to the left side, and then when the turns, you may be much more symmetric loading. Then you become asymmetric as soon as yeah. you get straight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't have um, like you know practical experiences with race riding horses. Um, I do have a lot of um, horses going in. How is it called in English? Vaulting. Is it like the yeah, you know, vaulting. Vaulting? Vaulting? yeah. Um, so this is um, where the horse will be also launched um, mainly on the left hand and um, from the horse perspective of course you have um, muscle adaptation to this um, situation in the well best case scenario the horse will be trained on the other side as well and only in competitions or um, or training of the vaulting, it goes left hand, but the other days of the week, um, it also gets the compensation training. I don't know if this is true for race horses as well. I, I no, hope so. No, because they run into so. each other if they do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they tried it. <laughs> they tried it and give up. Okay. Yeah, um, so what, up. I can <laughs> what I can imagine what will happen if a horse will be trained only on one side or mainly on one side, of course, what the the hollow side, like the left side, will be shortened in the muscle dimension, so more contract and uh, elongated on the outer side, which in the end will um, influence also the um, slippage of the saddle or the slippage or the movement of the rider because um, in this case, usually the hind, hind um, inner leg, so the hind left leg would probably um, be a little bit more laterally 
um, resulting in a movement of the horse rider to the um, to the contralateralist side. So I can imagine. I don't know. I don't have any experience in that, but I would. Um, this could be a very interesting question to yeah, to to study. Um, I would suggest there are think that the rider in the racehorse, um, if as soon as they get on a straight line, they probably tend, no, sorry, in the curve, they tend to go outside to the right side. And um, in the straight line, I don't know, depending on the on the compensation mechanism of the rider and the balance and abil uh, balance abilities, yeah. But, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting case because we have this natural experiment we conduct constantly, and there's one activity, there's one gait, there's, there's, they're always turning left, and it would be an interesting way to just even understand the biomechanics of the back, because you, you know, whatever is happening is happening in a clearly defined yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is something which is pretty clear actually. As soon as the the back. Um, um turns laterally for example on the left side so if the if a horse turns on the left side the spinous processes so mm, oh i think it's mirrored now but um if you have the spinous processes and the horse goes um in one direction the direction of the uh, rotation of the spinous processes is to the other side so meaning if you have a left turn the spinous processes the upper part of the spinous processes goes to the right side of the horse. Yeah, well, they would they would adapt. It would be bone remodeling. It would adapt to the left 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 turn as it remodeled, right? Um, what? Sorry. The bone remodeling, the adaptation of the back, would be to yeah. the left turn. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. I mean. Would be very interesting to um, um, dissect some <laughs> former horse uh, resources and to evaluate this this question. Yeah, that would be and, very interesting. And, and and the way to think about why that might be of interest, if we look at the catastrophic injury rate on um, with horses, it's much lower on synthetic. It's lower on dirt than it is. It's lower on turf, and that's highest on dirt. The uh, laterality of fractures on synthetic and turf is is almost nothing, but there's about a thirty percent or forty percent higher left front fracture rate on horses. The spine might be an interesting way to understand the limb loading on mm -hmm. these horses that are running on different surfaces. And the beauty of this is, you know, for, we have this huge data set of skeleton yeah. to be Absolutely. able to, 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 to look at that. But the data set, what does it include? Um, the um, dramatic injuries? where, when, and how much, or also some biomechanical parameters, such as, I don't know, any, I don't know, lameness at all, or uh, any body conditions or so? Well, you have lameness, and especially a horse that ended up on the vets list, uh, you would have information now that we've got a national vets list, you would have information about what they were having to do to get off the vets list in order to be able to race again. So this data wouldn't have existed until we had this national vets list. It would have existed in a few jurisdictions, but it ends up being this, you know, all of U.S. racing. Yeah, but that would mean that um, there kind of a history of um of the horse is is transparent now yes so it is it is one now. can one can could do some correlation uh, correlation studies about yeah former diseases um uh in relation to to catastrophic injuries for example and we're in the early stages. The vet records are going to be transferred between owners when they're claimed and all that. So we're getting, we're mm -hmm. getting, so this is getting to be a pretty good. But just the vet's list alone would be interesting. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe there's any, I don't know, significant um, correlations with, with back pain, back um, issues as well. Well, and, and, that, and what I'm thinking is this laterality of loading may be visible in the skeleton because of the adaptation of the of the back to the asymmetric loading on yeah. dirt versus turf. Yeah. Or yeah. Nice. Yeah. There would be a good, nice study object. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions? I am not a question. So, but um, I was definitely interested with one uh, portion of your presentation. You had uh, one of your clients, and um, as we've been talking about, like you were addressing like the asymmetric loading and riding of the yeah. rider in the saddle, and you showed before and after. Yeah, uh, um, this one. Yes. And then it, see this again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you made a comment that um, um, that like after the corrections, like you can still see that the rider has mm -hmm. is a little bit crooked their their yeah. self in the saddle, and and you mentioned that um, rehabilitation of the rider would be uh, uh, um, potentially like suggested or appropriate. I was just curious yeah. what, um, um, if you do actually recommend like like certain uh, exercise regimens or rehabilitation for the riders and whatnot, because um, I've heard. A lot of like news stories and whatnot here about people having like riding a horse for rehabilitation, but never rehabilitating yourself for the horse. Which I Absolutely. really like the idea. Yeah, no, I mean, excellent question. This um, this is kind of um, my daily advice actually to to the riders um, because well. I myself, I'm a rider too, and I'm completely crooked. You know, I have two kids, and I'm completely asymmetric and um, really have troubles riding my horse in a symmetric way. And um, I mean, the horse is a mirror for everything, also for your own asymmetry. And I have an example. Um, just yeah, some 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 weeks ago, I had a um, a client for a settling inspection for a settle analysis, and um, I it was a former client, so I knew that the horse it was a young horse, and I knew that um, the rider was actually quite symmetric um, so far. Um, I checked the saddle; it was symmetric as well. But then I have um, looked them or analyzed and evaluated them in motion dynamically, um, and also did the same as you see here in the video. So I always uh, record the the horse from the back to see the slippage or slipping of the saddle. And it was slipping dramatically to one side, and I was asking, "What is happening? Your your saddle is um, uh, symmetric. Your horse is kind of symmetric. I always measure the the symmetry of the horse, um, or at least to have some some hints about the symmetry. It looked or well, seemed to be quite symmetric. And then she said, and then I asked, "Okay, what about you? Did you have, had any injury, or what what has happened over the last period we haven't seen?" And she said, "Oh." Oh yeah, I completely forgot. I broke my hip. So yeah, I did some physiotherapy afterwards. It wasn't that bad. Just the, you know some muscles um, detaching of the hip and yeah some rehab. And um, after six weeks of um, rehab and physiotherapy, I thought I was fine. And yeah. um, I showed her the video afterwards, and it was really dramatic slip. And um, she was crooked. And um, yeah, I, I immediately advised some physiotherapy, which which what she did actually. And um, so this is something I really have an eye on. It's kind of my I really like this this type of um, you know um, evaluating the saddle and um, to try to find the the source of the crookedness. And um, by asking the people what is the history of their own, and um, sometimes they just have, you know, uh, crooked their ankle or something, but it can have dramatic impact on the stability, the symmetry, um, mm -hmm. and the yeah way of moving on the horse, which again have um, dramatic uh, impact on the on the balance of the horse as well. Mm -hmm. And you see it in each, you know, in each parameter in in the rider, in the horse, and in the saddle as well as, as a subsequent. And for me, as a saddle fitter, it's very important to um, have at least the one thing we can um, adjust, or I can adjust the saddle um, to be symmetric. Um, the rest is the job of the rider.
Yeah, but it's so so often there are some studies about the you know um, about the quantity of um, uh, the cause of this asymmetry if it's the rider if it's the horse or if it's the saddle and um, actually there is a study showing that most of the time um, interestingly it's the horse I was always thinking it's the rider you know blame the rider He's yeah it's because the riders the always blame themselves <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. But um, no, it's in at least in this study, it was the horse, and um, that was very, very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. And I often see it if you really go behind the horse and see the horse in motion, you often see that the um, in the different gates, the hoofs do not always well, well, most of the time, they do not always match the hind hoofs, do not match the um. Mm, how do you call this? Um, the what well, the hoof signs of the front legs, so they are not in line. And often, if a horse is crooked a little bit lateral to one side, for example, if the hind left leg goes a little bit more to the left side, so it's a little bit weaker and is not able to, um, you know, move towards the center of mass of the horse, then um, this often results in a um, in a um, how do you say this crooked um, hip? So the rider tends to crook in the same direction where the um, weaker le uh, hind leg um, is, for example, the left side. And by that, putting more pressure on the left panel and shifting the saddle to the opposite side, to the right side. So if I have a saddle without seeing the rider or the horse and see the left panel is a little bit softer compared to the right panel, um, in I don't have any studies of that, but I'd say in about 80% of the cases, the rider would um, be crooked a little bit to the left side. The hip goes a little bit into the into the left direction and um, the saddle will slip to the right side. And this is something I need to adjust in the saddle, um, at least to not having the saddle as a cause for the rider to sit crookedly. You know <laughs> what I mean? So... Of course, the initial or the primary 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 um cause is probably the the horse or the rider or both most of the times I think um but um yeah the saddle has to be straight and symmetric yeah well, and of course there are several um uh, exercises for the for the rider as well the you know YouTube and Instagram and everything they are full of advices for that <laughs> if you're interested <laughs> but I'm I'm not a you know I'm not a human physiotherapist but um being in treatment with my osteopathy um he always sees if um um you know if my hip is blocked to one side or the other so he already can um um yeah see where my problems are in, in writing as well. Yeah. Wow, that was very good. <laughs> very, very, very good received, very well received. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your interest. I'm I'm very happy. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank yeah. you Mary. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.